Welcome to tonight's forums for candidates seeking contested school board seats in the Jefferson City School District in the April 2nd election. I'm Gary Kasser, managing editor of the Jefferson City News Tribune, and I'll serve as moderator of tonight's forum. I want to thank the city for the use of the chambers for this forum, as well as JCTV for taping and airing the forums. We'll also be streaming the, the um, events over newstribune.com. Tonight our forum will feature the candidates for JCPS Board of Education. Four candidates will be seeking two, term, seeking two terms on the board, two seats on the board I should say. Prior to tonight, the candidates were advised the rules of the forum. As we begin the questions, the candidates will have two minutes to respond to each question. Seated next to me is Rebecca Martin, News Tribune City Editor. She'll serve as timekeeper for the responses. None of the questions have been shared with the candidates beforehand. During the course of the forum, I may ask a candidate a follow-up question in hopes of getting a clearer understanding of his or her stance. A candidate may also be granted time to respond or to rebut an answer from a previous question. So now let me introduce the candidates for tonight's forum. To my left is Stephanie Johnson. She's the executive director of the Jefferson City Boys and Girls Club. She's had a career in nonprofits and service that has included jobs with the United Way, Samaritan Center, and March of Dimes. Seated next to her is Steve Brown. He's retired after a career in insurance and is a former Marine. He lives just outside Holt Summit. Next to him is Jessica Green. She's an administrative assistant in Lincoln University's Office of Student Financial Services. She's also a youth leader at Jefferson City Church of God in Christ, and she directs the praise dancers there. And to, next to her is Lorelei Schwartz. She's an incumbent school board member who has served one term on the board and is the current treasurer of the board. She's an accountant with Schwartz and LeCure in Jefferson City. The order for the questions and closing statements was determined before the forum by drawing lots. So now we're going to jump in and just start the questioning. We'll start with Stephanie. <clears throat> Stephanie, how would you as a board member support, expand, or improve upon the district's efforts to get all of its students reading at or above their grade level? Well, I want to start with uh, saying uh, I'm really proud of the school board and the administration for making that a focus. Um, we need more children in our district reading at or above grade level. And I think the initiative, the JC Reads, um, where we're really putting that focus on um, the elementary and middle school students to increase the time that they're spending reading. I know there was some talk uh, amongst the board and the administrators uh, regarding taking the money that will be saved with the time change, the, the start and end time, and utilizing that to divide out uh, language arts and reading at the secondary level. And I think that's a really good idea because that's a lot of curriculum and a lot of content that is being put into one class. If we are working to ensure that reading it's in itself is uh, a designated core class, I think that will help. Um, you know, the elementary schools receive title funding to give uh, some additional reading services to elementary children. <clears throat> but there's not a lot at the secondary level. So I think that, that is a, a really good idea. I would support that. And I think we just have to continue to not only read to the children and have them read, but we really want to encourage reading in the home. Um, it's really important that children uh, are reading beyond their classroom. I know at the Boys and Girls Club, reading is a a daily part of what we do and so it's just continuing to push um, funding and resources and and making it a priority and not just um, changing course until we really move the needle in that area okay thank you Steve same question <clears throat> I, it's obvious that reading sh should be a priority uh, without if you can't read you can't do anything you cannot weld you cannot build a car it's the basis foundation for learning is being able to read the very fact that the school has put a priority on it 
Well, they ought to. I find right now the uh, reading uh, threshold of who can read and who can't read uh, abhorrent. I mean, seven, even if it's the top, from Stacey want to do 65 to 75 as a goal. I, I find 75 percent even being able to read is underachieving. We need to be able to read kids need to be able to read. Parents as Teachers is a program that the state of Missouri has that uh, they started it again and they funded it and it's a good program. Start these kids, parents, because you know parents don't have, you can't fire the parents. Parents are the parents. So you got to help the parents help themselves. There's no manual to raise your kids. You do the best you can. But sometimes your best isn't just quite good enough and you need a little help. Parents as Teachers does that. When these kids come into kindergarten, they should already be able to know their numbers and be able to know their alphabet, and, and that would be a goal there. But uh, a 75, 65 to 75 percent success <coughs> ratio to me is, it's not good enough for me. Okay, thank you. Jessica? Um, I'd say it starts by first understanding that not every child learns the same way. So when you decide that you want to increase reading, but you take this standard and it's the same across the board, it's not necessarily going to work because what works for child A is not going to work for child B. So the first step is knowing how each of these children are learning and then implementing programs that are going to help them learn in their own specific way. Um, next, I agree that it does also start in the home. Um, but we've got to provide parents with the resources and the education that, they, that they need because some parents probably themselves have a hard time reading. So if I am struggling with reading, it's going to be hard for me to teach my child how to read. So we've got to focus on the whole family so that the kids can benefit and their reading levels will increase. Thank you. Lorelai? Well, I, I do agree with Jessica. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at in the school district is uh, more dyslexia screenings so that we can catch some of these children earlier and get them resources earlier so that they don't struggle for very long. The other thing that we've invested in is the iReady uh, program which tests children because it, we need to know where they are so we can meet them where they are and that has been a very successful program and I think that once we get these things in place and we can get them younger and younger and get them keep them on their grade level reading level we won't have to pick up the middle school and high school kids who are, are behind. Um, so we are diverting resources to this and we are um, explaining to every teacher, the PE teachers, the algebra teachers, how important it is for reading. And so they're teaching their subject, but they are keeping in mind that we are focusing on reading and we want them to focus on the children reading in all classes if they can. And so we are just putting a lot more emphasis uh, on, on that with every teacher. All right. Thank you. Okay, our next question will start with Steve. Former board members have suggested they felt pressured to not share their thoughts on school board decisions. Instead, they were instructed to, quote, toe the line and let the board president be the voice so that there's a unified message coming from the board. If elected, what would be your approach as a board member? I would be available. I, I would. Uh, I plan on going to PTA meetings and things like that and being available to the public. If they ask me what's going on, I'm going to tell them. Uh, I, I, I heard, I read in a paper about that uh, accusation. Uh, I heard the president of the school board, Mr. Bruce, on the radio address that. Uh, I don't know that I got a firm yes or no out of it, but, but I, I just find that hard to believe that that there's a secret squirrel pact amongst the board members that they don't talk to the public. But I can assure you that if I'm elected, uh, I will talk to the public because that's <laughs> that's who elected me. Okay, thank you. Jessica? Um, I believe in honesty and I believe in transparency. Um, I'm not going to, I mean, I wouldn't go out just saying stuff, you know, without knowing what it is I'm talking about, but I definitely don't believe in secrecy. The board is here to serve the students and the staff, not the other way around. So if they have a question, I believe that we should answer their questions 
honestly. We shouldn't beat around the bush. We should be direct. This is what's happening. This is what is going on. Um, because when you're not, they don't trust you to make the best decisions for them. Okay. Thank you. Lorelai? Um, well, I do think it's important to for the board president to speak on behalf of the board, but I don't believe that that means that the board members are hindered in what they can speak about. Um, I, I speak to lots of people every day about board activities, uh, but you, generally it's the board president who speaks to the press, not that they can't speak to any of the other board members, <coughs> but that is kind of the role of the president. But I wouldn't say that I certainly have never felt hindered in speaking to anybody about anything, including the press. When Philip calls me, I answer Philip's questions. So I, you know, I, I don't think that that's happening at all. I don't feel it. At least I didn't feel that way. Okay. Thank you. Stephanie? I think right now we're in a place where it's got to be about trust. It's all about trust. Um, our communities trust in our in our administration and our school board um, the teachers trust in the administration and the school board and I think that philosophy or that mindset just feeds into that mistrust I if I were elected I would I would be shocked if someone said that I couldn't speak about my experience or my opinion um, I just that would be unacceptable to me um, I just I, I'm, I have a hard time thinking that that is going on I hope it is not it wouldn't be something that I would support okay thank you uh, next question we'll start with Jessica the school district has six active lawsuits against it including four employment discrimination lawsuits three of the employment discrimination lawsuits have been filed in 2019 this question comes from Reader Holzem. If elected, what will you do to change the culture that contributes to lawsuits? Um, it starts by taking a look at what you're doing wrong. And when it comes to discrimination, diversity is important starting at the top, for starters. Um, I say that all the time. You have to make sure that there are people who are going to look at a situation before they fire someone or before they choose to let someone go they're going to look at it with an open mind and an open heart and really figure out what's going on and make sure that they're not being that the person who's being let go is not being fired because of whether it be race their age their sex um, just to make sure that we are doing everything that we can do to ensure that we are not treating people differently based on those situations and those issues but again, it starts by having a diverse group of people at the top who are making those decisions. By the way, a follow-up, do you believe that exists now, a diverse group of, no. of people at the top? Our, our Board of Education building is, is diverse as far as um, sex is concerned. There's both male and female, but when it comes to culture and it comes to race, it's not diverse. The top is not diverse at all when it comes to that. Okay. Lorelei. Um, <clears throat> culture is something that we've been working on for quite some time. Um, when Larry got here four years ago, this district was in a, a huge mess. The culture in all of the buildings was negative. It, you know, there, that's when the lawsuit started. Um, and you can't move that needle immediately. But I do believe that we are moving the needle. Um, I believe that there were some poor hiring practices that happened before Larry got here. I believe that there were people hired for positions that had no business being in those positions, which is why our APR was 70.7 .7 when Larry got here four years ago. And you have to make difficult decisions sometimes about getting the right people in the right positions so that you can move the needle. Our APR now is 87.3 in four years. But sometimes that means people become disgruntled. I can't tell you whether they felt hostile, like they were in a hostile environment or not. They obviously felt like they were in a hostile environment. So we still have work to do in that area. But I will tell you that I just think that there were a lot of people in positions that shouldn't have been where they were. And you know, if we're gonna, if we're gonna truly educate our children, we have to have the right people in the right positions. And sometimes those are really hard decisions to make. 
but we are still working on the culture and we know but I, I, I the t when I talk to the teachers and I actively ask the teachers how are things how are how are things feeling you know things are feeling pretty good Fe things are feeling better we're trying to move the needle it doesn't happen overnight so how far along the process do you believe that you are uh, I don't I don't really know I that's hard to tell I haven't been in every building I think some <coughs> buildings are struggling more than others uh, and I haven't been in every building to to ask every teacher but I, I think things are getting better and I can tell you this I think that um, there's a whole lot more of asking teachers and staff about how they're feeling and what their thoughts and concerns are than there was happening four years ago and I think that they're feeling better about that and we are trying to respond to those things okay thank you Stephanie same question when it comes to the lawsuits I think that um, on on one hand like Laurel I said you have to ensure that the people who are educating our children are well equipped um, that they have the tools to be successful because at the end of the day it is about the education that we provide to the children having said that it's so important that policies and procedures are in place um, that policies dictate um, the way the culture of the system and the procedures are in place that have to be followed I have not I don't have access to um, the performances of these individuals I don't know if um, these lawsuits are disgruntled or if there was legitimate discrimination that was happening but I always think from a, a board level it is about first and foremost ensuring that your policies and your procedures are looked at analyzed and are practiced okay Steve well I know one thing Jefferson City School District ought to be on the Christmas list, get a Christmas card from that attorney that's making a living off from us. That's for sure. I believe there's 1,400 employees, am I correct? 1,400 employees, so grand scope of thing, uh, it's a small percentage, but one's too many. It's a very small percentage of the disgruntled employees, but that could very well be that proverbial tip of the iceberg as well. Uh, you can there's a lot of buzzwords you can say use and develop this and do this and want to go forward and but one thing one of the reasons I decided to run was when I started getting the whiff of, of these lawsuits and I went straight down and said hey I'd like to run for school board and that this was one of the catalysts of it was these lawsuits the uh, one of the things that the school board has done, which to me made perfect good sense, they, the HR person and the litigation person, the legal person, they split the jobs up. They used to be the same person. Your HR person there would be the one that would decide, you know, if it's a good or bad, if, if you've been discriminated against or sexual harassment, they would make that decision and whatever. Now that job has been split. Uh, uh, bifurcated and it should have been a long time ago for that matter and I think Ms. Swartz alluded to the fact that uh, there were some people in positions that shouldn't have been and that right there was a combination of a position that should not have been one person uh, I, I don't as far as discrimination and and the, the suits and things that are going on uh, I guess we'll find out because someone needs to find out there's a captain of the ship and the captain has a boss and that's us okay next question we're gonna go deeper into the subject of lawsuits um, in large part because I much like Steve mentioned it is a topic that is um, resonating within the district so I think it deserves a little bit more attention so we'll start with Lorelei do you think the boards effectively responded to the workplace climate and culture within the district if you're to serve another term on the board are there things you would improve to address the level of trust between staff and administrators and how would you tangibly define or measure progress and success um, you know 
we we now talk to the staff about uh, climate and culture in the elementary schools uh, and we implore on them that they need and they have they are now rounding uh, each week in the elementary in all the schools every uh, board uh, at the board office each one of the members there goes to a school each week to round to hear the boots on the ground telling them here's what our our problems are here's the resources that we need here here are things that we here's how behavior is uh, ha happening in our schools and what can we do to uh, help ensure that our kids are getting educated. And we're responding to those things, uh, particularly over at Morrill Heights. Um, we had some behavior issues. We had teachers or parents contacting us and, and the board office went right over and we put things in place right away. And, you know, it, and then we're responding back to those teachers and saying, okay, how are these things working? You know, we just started uh, breakfast in the classroom there. And I went over and visited and spoke to one of the teachers and said, is this more burden for you than it is benefit? She said, absolutely not. But I wanted to hear from myself. And I think that all the administrative staff is going over to all the schools and they're asking. And I think that's really improving the culture. And how do we measure that? You know, we're doing surveys. We're, we're surveying the teachers more often and asking them how, how are they feeling, and we're responding to those instead of putting them on a shelf. Uh, and I think that we are um, more apt to have the hard discussions that maybe were ignored in the past. And so that's, that's and we as board members are following up on that and asking the questions. Okay, a couple follow-up questions to that so that I understand. What is rounding? Um, they just go to the schools um, and they walk around the hallways and visit with the teachers and visit with the, uh, the, the, the custodians and, and the lunch people and the principals and the assistant principals and just get a pulse of what's how that building is feeling. Is it feeling stressful? Is it feeling calm? Is it, are they feeling like they need resources? They're trying to get feedback from the people in the school so that they can respond appropriately. If you're not communicating with the people, how do you know what the problem is? And which school are you uh, assigned or you have volunteered? Oh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not rounding. It's the administrative staff in the board office, but we, um, Ken Inlow and uh, Lindsay Rowden do visit each, a school a month, I think, uh, every school, and just go sit and maybe read in the library with the kids so that we do have board members in the schools. Um, I go to various schools for various functions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question will be to Stephanie. Um, what would you do as a board member to improve the climate and culture within the school district, and how would you define or measure progress and success? Well, I think they did a good job by starting with the survey, um, and the results of that came out last fall. Um, I was at the board meeting when uh, Brenda Hatfield presented those results. And I have to be honest, I was a little surprised um, at some of the, the responses. Um, they were a little lower than I would definitely like to see. And I think that's, a, that's your baseline. That's where you start. We all like to um, tout our accomplishments and what we're doing great, but if you're going to move the needle, you have to focus on where are the lowest scores. I would look at that survey and I would say, I want to see the three things where we scored the lowest. And if I recall, one of them was communication um, from, from the administrative office. If that's my recollection being one of them that I, I thought was concerning. Um, the rounding is wonderful that that's taking place now. And it's my understanding that the administrators rotate um, so they can get to different buildings. I think you have to give a voice to the teachers and the principals. They have to know that not only do they have a voice, but that someone is listening to their voice. It, it doesn't matter if you ask someone their opinion, but, but you never take their advice. Um, your boots on the ground teachers <coughs> know more about what's really happening in our schools than anyone else. I would also like to see those survey results by building. I know some principals have incredible culture in their schools and others struggle and what can we do to ensure that principals who have a school with unhappy teachers 
what can we do to mentor those principals to be stronger leaders within their school okay Steve what would you do as a board member to improve the climate and culture within the school district and how would you define or measure progress and success well visiting with the troops in the field call it boots on the ground call them teachers uh, that's that's where it starts because it's like the old saying if mama ain't happy ain't nobody happy if the teachers aren't happy if they're they're not going to be doing a good job you got to support the teachers the uh, teacher retention teacher retention it would probably be one of the ways I would measure success uh, Blair Oaks has no problem with teacher retention matter of fact a large part uh, part of their staff are former students at Blair Oaks now why isn't Jeff City that way I don't know I'm not privy to all the reports and things that maybe some have seen because I'm kind of an outsider coming in uh, I don't know how much gravitas as a board member that I'll have I don't know uh, but I plan on finding out and uh, going to the schools and walking around uh, I don't know why the principals I would ask that the principals and the assistant principals in the schools sit with the teachers and, and monitor and see what's going on as well and uh, by the way the breakfast in the classroom that was mentioned it's been a huge success huge success it's good somebody had a good idea I'm not used to that but it was it's was a good idea all right thank you Jessica after news broke of the most recent lawsuit filed against the school district you publicly called for quote new administration and board members what exactly were you proposing what do you think that approach would solve or accomplish and how um, so I'd say that people need to either be removed or they need to be educated so I had the opportunity to actually click on the link and actually read the court petition and our superintendent is alleged to have said things that not only offended me as an african-american woman with african-american children but as a woman in general um, and like I said I was not at any of those meetings where he's alleged to say those things but there be there comes a point when you have been in the education game too long to continue to be ignorant or to continue to just let whatever fly out of your mouth um, so if people are not going to think before they speak or if they are not able to recognize the position that they're in then either they need to be removed or it calls for serious education for how they can offend other people or how things that they sound look so exactly what were you proposing and what do you think that that approach would accomplish or solve so I mean I like I said I propose either education or removal of people who are just gonna let whatever it is fly out of their mouth without even thinking about it um, so when I think about for example someone who a superintendent who would possibly say that we need to watch for children of color in saggy pants um, you don't get to say that because just because a child is of color or where there where's their pants saggy what is it that you're watching out for exactly so either I mean I would like I said people just have to watch what they're gonna say educate themselves if they don't if we can't give them the education then someone needs to come and teach them the education or they need to be gone that's the bottom line you just cannot say that and feel that way about anybody especially our students that we are dealing with we are here to nurture them and guide them through school and we can't look at them because they are a child of color or because they wear saggy pants or because they're disabled or whatever the case may be and feel like we need to be careful and cautious of those kinds of children okay thank you Stephanie next question I'll start with you mm -hmm. this comes from uh, reader Jane Lester do you think JCPS should have more proactive community town halls uh, she notes the meetings have been called to address problems after they have occurred and changes the schools want 
to make, but no meetings have been called to update the community on the results of past meetings or to listen to concerns or explain new programs such as changes in instruction and testing involving technology. I think that the district, I mean, Larry, Dr. Linthicum, you know, he has his, I think it's Coffees with Larry, um, where he regularly has a, an opportunity for members of our community to come, talk to him, ask questions. I know he has very much an open door policy. He will meet with just, a, just about anyone. I do think it's a good idea to have formalized forums that actually talk about the results. Um, I know the district is always sending out surveys, they're asking opinions um, in, in a formal forum manner, um, but you're right, there isn't a formal forum per se that says, okay, here's how, here's how it laid out, here's how we rolled that out and why. Um, so I think that's a good idea. But I do feel that Dr. Linthicum is quite open to communicating with the community and listening and meeting with them and you know I think um, I think people need to take more advantage of those okay would you would you suggest the school board members should be at those forums or those environments rather than just administrators absolutely um, at the end of the day a lot of the the, the school boards making a lot of the decisions so um, I, I would assume that the school board is making decisions based on the recommendations of people who are professional educators um, who have experience in, in the education realm. But since they are ultimately the ones that are voting on these subjects, I think absolutely. Um, I would, I would want to be there to say I, I voted yay or nay and here's why. Here's why I made that decision. Okay. Steve, same question. Well, I, between uh, Mr. Lithgow's, uh the coffee clutches that he does, you know, and, and the newspaper, uh, I, I, I think people have a lot of opportunities to see what's going on. And, of course, there's this thing called the telephone. Pick it up and call me, and I'll tell you. As far as organ, I think you can uh, beat that horse to death, you know, having a, it loses its its meaning if you have a town hall, you know, let's have one every week, let's have one every month, how many do you want? It loses, the, the impact is gone, but there's plenty of ways for people to find out what's going on, and, and I would be more than happy to accommodate them. Okay, I think the point of her question is, though, that it's a more of a two-way communication rather than just hearing a report. I think is well in which medium do you want to, to communicate you know uh, I, I can't call up every you know the public right. so how do you how do you wish us to communicate is my question to you uh, I would be glad to go to forums I go to PTA meetings and things like that and visit the schools the teachers and such uh, as far as getting the word out I think the word has been getting out and here recently, it hadn't been very good news. Okay. Jessica, same question. Um, I'd say that public meetings are awesome. I think they're great. I've actually been to a couple of the Coffee with Larry's. I think the problem with them is when they are doing them. Coffee with Larry is at 7.30 the first Friday of every month. And when, I mean, that's the time that most people are getting ready for work and they're getting their kids dropped off. And the, two, the few that I've gone to, there's not very many parents there, if any at all, because I can't come and get this information because you're scheduling at a time when I'm getting off to work and I'm getting my kids off to school. So I think meetings are great. I think they should definitely happen. I think there should be more of them. Like Stephanie said, that don't only give you, you know, we want to know your questions, but you know, now we're going to have a follow-up meeting and tell you the outcome of that last meeting. But you've also got to do them at a time when people can actually get to them in order for them to be effective. So what time would you suggest would be more conducive to um, I, attendance? Like I know for a lot of people that I know, evenings work great because you're off work. Um, you can get kids settled in and do things like that and then get to your meeting. 
So I definitely can say that although I love coffee with Larry and I think it's a great idea, 7.30 in the morning, I just don't feel like it works when you, if you're saying that you want parents to come and give you their input and you want parents to come and be informed. Okay. Lorelai, same question. Well, I, I do think Coffee with Larry has been great. Um, in um, the last meeting, people brought their kids with them, mm -hmm. um, and which was great, I thought. It, um, and they were elementary school kids. But I do think that maybe staggering that occasionally at Coffee with Larry and maybe, I don't know, Ice Cream with Larry in the evenings or something. However, we had the two forums for the start times, and we got complaints about when they were. You know, and so every every household has a different schedule and what's going to work. But you know, I I don't know that a Saturday is out of the question either. A Saturday morning when maybe people aren't working and don't have school. But I the I like the coffee with Larry because it is very much an open dialogue. They present usually what is the um, topic that they want to talk about today, and they usually they every time they've gone over the construction. How is the construction going? We get an update on that. We get an update on whatever the topic is this time it's been start times uh, and then it's the last 15 minutes is reserved for question and answer for whatever anybody wants to ask about various things so I think it's been a great dialogue um, I, mean, I think it's a start I think that there's always I'm a big believer in that you can get better every day I believe that so definitely I think that we could improve on some of the times okay thank you Next question, we'll start with Steve. JCPS earned an annual performance review score of 87.9% for the 2017-18 school year. That score will be a new baseline to compare against for the next few years. And the district has said it shows progress in students' reading proficiency. However, JCPS tied for the third lowest score out of 22 school districts in our area. What would your priorities be based on the district's latest APR score? Well, it's pretty dismal. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure what kind of tools that can be put in force to make kids learn. The teachers are the key. Something's not happening. There's something not going on there. Even the goal that they had set was low compared to other schools. As, uh, I, uh, I don't know why the Jeff City School District is performing so poorly. I've not been privy to the reports, all the detailed reports and stuff. I know just about what everybody else knows from what I've read in the paper. You know, not been on the school board. I, I don't get the reports and things that maybe some people do that, that are in academia, I'm not part of academia. So I can only say that it is it is poor, it's poor performance. How anybody can be proud of that, I don't understand. Okay, Jessica, same question. Well, it definitely just goes back to figuring out what, how students are learning. Um, again, you can't teach all students the same. We want reading levels to definitely go up. We want them to rise, but we can't teach all of them the same exact way. Um, also, having people who specialize in reading and being able to figure out exactly why a child is struggling, um, getting parents involved, which I know sometimes can be hard, um, getting parents to understand that there is an issue, there is a problem, and giving them the resources they need to help take care of that at home. Children are in school for a majority of their day, but when they get out of school and, and they go home, the same thing that they're doing in school to get their reading level up needs to be placed in their home so that that way they're getting it in both places. So it's just a matter of knowing what's going on, figuring out with each child what your issue is and how we can specifically help you with your reading issue to make it better. Okay, Lorelai, same question. Well, here's where I'm gonna use Jessica's word. Our school, our school population is more diverse than, I bet you, 90% of those 22 districts we're being compared with. Maybe it's, if Columbia's in there, it's us in Columbia. So our children, we are serving a different type of children than 
we you know how many children we have from a single family home versus what Blair Oaks has from a single family or single parent home I mean it's a difficult comparison but I can tell you and people who don't really look at APR don't understand a little bit what we're what we're judged on part of its attendance that's the reason why we backed up the school day because studies show that when you s start the secondary kids later you get better attendance and better graduation rates and those are two things that you are judged on for your APR so we are trying to make responses uh, to those to increase our APR we understand that 87 point nine is a high level to beat but we're putting things in place to get higher and part of the thing was the start times and I realized that was controversial and parents didn't like that because they have to find more daycare but we're here to educate children we're here to make sure they go to school and that they graduate and studies show that that's going to happen so the school dist district is responding daily to these things to get better okay thank you Stephanie same question sure the APR is a very complex formula. It's so complex, I don't understand it. I know you can earn points for things, points are taken away for things. Um, it's more than just a score. But I believe that Lorelei and Jessica are absolutely correct. You cannot compare Jefferson City's AP, APR score with Blair Oaks, with Eldon, with Russellville. Um, we have such a higher free and reduced lunch rate. Um, really, Columbia in our area is, is the one we need to look at. And I know we're not where Columbia is. So again, it is about drilling down. Um, is it an attendance problem? Is it a, a test scoring problem? What areas specifically are we so below the curve that it's throwing the whole score off? And that's where we need to focus in and really figure out, okay, what can we do to change that? Um, and if, if attendance was um, what was really keeping us lower, then, you know, you have to do whatever you have to do to increase attendance. Um, it is, I think sometimes the APR score can be a little misleading because it's, it's so complex. I, you know, when I first saw it, I, was, I thought it was just simply... Um, test scores and grades and there's a lot there's you get points if you've increased year over year um, so we can't compare ourselves to every district I think it's fair to compare us to Columbia you've got to drill down on where specifically are we underperforming okay we're going to drill down JCPS earned 22.5 points out of a possible 30 for its graduation rate 7.5 points out of a possible 10 for its attendance rate on the most recent APR. The district's 17-18 graduation rate was 84.5 percent. The attendance rate was 87.7 percent. How would you as a board member seek to improve the district's attendance and graduation rates? And we start with Jessica. Yeah. First you have to figure out with attendance why aren't kids coming to school? Um, I know that there was just the thing done where they, the nurse sent out an email talking about how many flu cases we had. So for that, I think it's unfair to count that attendance against us because, I mean, you don't want to bring your kids to school if they're sick because then they just get other kids sick or staff members sick. So you look at why students are not in school. Um, and then what was the other part graduation rates so and when it comes to graduation rate again you just got to figure out what's going on that they're not graduating is it because I missed too many days so I can't can't graduate am I not reaching my credits that I can't graduate and you've just got to work with each kid again to figure out what's going on where are things lacking is it a mixture of school and home that's causing these issues because if it is then we have to figure out how to get both of them in line with each other and if it's just school then we need to figure out what's going on with school um, and if it's just home then we have to figure out what's going on with home Lorelai same question well I, as I just said one of the big reasons that we wanted to push back the start times is because the the pediatrician came and said you know the um, American Association of Pediatrics recommends that you start times later for these 
adolescent, the, the middle school and high school kids because they, they need to sleep a little longer. And I think part of it is they can't get up and so they miss first block and so they just don't come at all for school. So I'm really hoping that that's going to help increase attendance. The other thing that we know helps kids stay in school and graduate is being involved in an activity. And having a second high school is really going to improve that. I mean, we have a lot of activities at the current high school, but it's going to give more kids a chance to participate in activities to have two separate high schools. And if we can get kids involved in activities, we know that that helps them stay in school and graduate. So those are two of the things that we're really focused on uh, to change, to increase those numbers. Okay. Stephanie? A few years ago, I had a, a young man who was coming to the Boys and Girls Club, and out of nowhere, he starts getting D's and F's. He was a, a freshman at Simonson. And I went to meet with uh, his school counselor to find out what we could do to help improve his grade. And the counselor said, if you really want to help this kid, you need to tell him to start coming to school because he has the worst truancy record of any student in our, in our school. So that day after school, when this young man came to my office, um, I, as a mom, I was ready to chew on him. You know, you can't skip school. You got to go to school. Well, come to find out, mom had a change in her job, and it was older sister's responsibility to get him up and get him to school. But half the time, she was at her friend's house, and he wasn't getting to school because no one was home to wake him up. And if I'm not waking up my 17 year old, he's definitely not going to school. So we bought this young man an alarm clock and we showed him how to use it and there are many children that are coming to our school with food insecurities difficult environments at home and obstacles and i think we need to do a better job of finding out if we have a child that is chronically missing chronically late we have to take the time to talk to them to find out what is happening that is causing that so I think that is with attendance. With graduation, I am a firm believer that not every student is college bound. I think that we have got to really look at our vocational education program. We have to ensure that we're providing an education environment that fits a lot of different kids. And I think uh, but we, uh, again, uh, my experience is at Boys and Girls Club, but we had a young man who, who was not doing well here. And uh, he was sent to go live with a relative in St. Louis. And their high school had this robust culinary program. And I know that we've added that. Um, and that's wonderful. But I don't think had he gone to that school in St. Louis, he would not have graduated. And so I think we have to really look at diversity in our education program, including vocation. Okay. Thank you. Steve, same question. Well, the start time was a good move. That was a good, good start to help attendance for sure the uh, we do have different types of kids than they do at the surrounding communities and stuff I think we're like 30 percent minority in our school which doesn't even reflect the community I think the community is not that diverse but we are we got 30 percent minority the um, the attendance and graduation that the, the uh, I think having the um, more activities for the kids I don't know if that was justification to build a new high school I think if they wanted to do something have an activity they could have done it could have been on the chess club or a cheerleader or whatever at the school they were at but I, I regress the um, we need the teachers cannot do it all we need the resources as Ms. Johnson referred to this the children that uh, I haven't had these personal because I'm I don't have any children they're all gone I'm an old guy but I've been around I've seen a thing or two we need the resources that we can help these families that do have these children that that need help you know uh, we've got breakfast in school now so the kids aren't hungry through the day uh, you know there's churches and different things that could be of help but the school can't do it all we need the resources to be able to, to perhaps if we see a problem in the school to refer them to somebody or we're going to have to get up off our wallets and provide that resource in the school so they can do it we can't teachers can't do it and and uh, I certainly don't know the kids I can't go to their uh, not that the mom and dad would listen to me anyway but they do need help and we need to make that available to them. OK, 
Okay, thank you. Next question, we'll start with Lorelai. This came from uh, a reader. Effective responses to inappropriate and or disruptive behaviors at school involve appropriate referrals and proper intervention. What goal can we craft for reducing non-constructive behaviors that does not suggest limiting referrals and time out of classrooms? More generally, the question is, how do you believe the district should address student behavioral issues? Well, <coughs> I'm going to turn to what Stephanie said. A lot of times these behaviors are just a symptom of what's really going on with these kids. And I am not a believer in um, sending kids out of school. I am a believer of uh, maybe having a, a separate room in the school for them to go to, uh, to learn how to maybe calm down and learn, especially younger children. I'm, I'm speaking now to maybe elementary school children. Some of them don't have the social skills that they need um, in the classroom. And so uh, perhaps of transitioning in and out of the classroom so that they can have some calm down time and go back into the classroom and see if they can have the proper behavior. And then if they can't, they go back to maybe the transition room. And with the older kids, um, you know, we took in a kid who was homeless and they tried to send him away from school. And I, I said, you can't send him away from school. He has nowhere to go. I, and we have to be cognizant of this, that some of these children do not have anywhere to go if you send them out of school. So it's important to, to, for us to figure out how to keep them in school, not only for their class time, but to teach them proper behavior. And I think that once you get to the root of what the problem is, this man just needed an alarm clock. If we can get to the root of what's really causing the behavior, then we can solve these problems. It's a, it's a monumental task, but we're starting to put some of those things in place in some of our schools. And I think that we can, if we can get them at a really young age in the elementary schools with this behavior issue, then it's gonna alleviate some of the problems at the older ages. Okay, Stephanie. I'm pretty passionate about this one uh, because of where I work. There are so many children that come to school that cannot learn because there are so many other things going on. And it's not just um, the kids that need an alarm clock or the, or the electricity's turned off in their home or uh, things of that nature. There are other children who they they, they're the boss in their house. You know, they call the shots in their home. Um, their parents lack some parenting skills and have lost control and so a child who calls the shots at home comes to school and they're prepared to call the shots at school and it doesn't happen and it causes conflict and every uh, and everything else in between but if we want to improve the APR scores and we want to get higher reading we first it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy we have to solve some other things first we have to build some life skills we have to handle teaching coping mechanisms of children. There are a lot of things that have to happen before a child is just open and ready to learn. I do not think that children should be taken out of their school and sent to a location and say, well, in this location they will receive counseling and all these wonderful services, but what's the criteria to go there? What's the criteria to come back? What's the stereotyping once they're there? I've talked to some behavioral specialists in our district and frankly there's not enough of them because we need to have a team really that's there for that crisis intervention you know there's got to be nothing worse for a teacher when she's trying to educate a group of kids and you have a meltdown of one child I mean I've heard stories of where they've had to vacate children out of a classroom oh I only have 10 seconds left darn it um, and so to, to have a professional that's there for that crisis intervention and then a, a separate classroom where they can teach the children special skills, coping, emotional, and then of course the ability to follow up with the students when they're back in their classrooms to see how things are going. It's going to take a team. Okay. Steve. <clears throat> you know, you can sound heartless. You can sound pretty hardcore over this, but where do you draw the line when one child or two children are dragging down the whole class? Uh, does uh, Joe's kid deserve to be punished because Mary's kid misbehaves and disrupts the whole class? So you've got to have discipline in a classroom. 
Now, with that being said, some of these children do have problems at home. They're disturbed. There's, they got issues, and they need to be helped. I don't think they should be moved from the school premises. I think that is a stigma. I remember growing up as a kid that there was this thing called the reform school, and they put kids away for misbehaving in class. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to pull a knife on somebody. You just misbehaved in class. A separate room in a school, for, especially for the little one, would be great with people there that are trained to know what's going on. Teachers aren't trained to do that. It's not their job. They need to be teaching. For the older kids, the same thing. They need to be talked to, communicated with. Uh, the smaller kids, you know, you got to dig to find out what's going on there. The older kids, you can talk to them, but we need people on site to talk to them. But where the rubber hits the road, I'm here to tell you, it should be uniform in every school. Punishment should be severe and swift when necessary, compassionate when necessary. But we don't destroy the whole system. Don't drag everybody down for one's benefit. As a former Marine, the platoon is only as strong as the weakest link. You got to carry on, push on. Okay, Jessica. Well, I agree with the ladies and everyone else that um, s things that happen at home definitely affect kids when they go to school. I also agree that we also have to talk to parents and you can't really know what's going on with the students that we're serving if you're not already emerged in this community in some way, shape or form, whether it be volunteer service, um, whether it be you know them from your church. Um, I also can say that I am one who I don't believe in OSS just because you have kids who we don't need to have them at home because as Stephanie said, we don't think bad things are going on. But then you have kids who I want to be at home because home is like a vacation for me from school. Right. Um, so I'd say that a lot of redirecting is needed. And then I also need, would say, have to say that we have to, teachers have to evaluate exactly what behavior issues they're, they're having. I have an eight year old. And I remember when I got the first phone call that, oh, she was playing in the snow and we don't want her to play in the snow. It's unreasonable for you to take her outside for recess when it's just snowed and then want her to not play in the snow. Now, I told my eight-year-old that you do need to do what's asked of you because they're not asking you to hurt yourself, but I also let that teacher know what you're asking is unreasonable. Like, I'm an adult, and if I get outside and there's snow, chances are I'm going to pick up some of it, make a snowball throw it or whatever. So we have to make sure that what we're considering to be a behavior issue is actually a behavior issue. Even from, I've been told, you're, she's just really wiggly. What does that even mean? Like that's not means to tell her to go to the hallway. Like what, is, what do you mean by she's wiggly? Um, so we definitely have to take a look at different things that we can do. And conversations usually, from my experience, I've been that kid who got kicked out of school and then it was just we're going to toss you back in your classroom and no one ever has a conversation with you to figure out why did you do what you did and how can we help make things better for you? It was just we're going to kick you out of school for a week and we'll send you back. But there's no, there was no understanding of why I did what I did. And no one walked me through how to make it better. So we have to fix that as well. Okay. So do you believe, um, let's just follow up for all of you on the same question. So we'll start again with Lorelei on this. Do you believe the district has sufficient resources to handle behavioral issues currently? No way. And what would it look like for it to do it? So what have you mentioned, for instance, it should not be solely the teacher's responsibility, for instance. Right. We so what, what does it look like? We need more mental health. We need more mental health professionals in our school. What Stephanie said, behavior interventionists. I mean, first of all, they're, in, they're scarce. You can't find them. And so we're going to have to divert resources from somewhere else. But we we know it's important we'd like to do it but we have to find the people to fill the, the spots um, and we have diverted resources to get the ones that we have uh, but we could use a whole a whole bunch more but one of the things we need to do is create partnerships with some of our mental health professional organizations and we've started to talk to some of those organizations about what we can do to help partner to get some resources for our kids so that's what Larry is always talking about, learning, partnership, stewardship. 
and we are constantly looking for ways to partner with people just like our mentoring program with the, the big brothers and big sisters and they've taken it over and they've done a fantastic job and we need to do the same thing with mental health professionals we've just got to get um, more resources into our school and it's not even lack of money uh, maybe I mean we'd have to divert resources but there's lack of people to fill the jobs same question Stephanie totally agree uh, each of our elementary schools needs a small team um, of professionals that are working I heard a rumor and I don't know if it's true or not but that there was one behavioral specialist that was shared between the two middle schools that is unbelievable to me because behavior problems issues social and emotional learning concerns in elementary those are going to manifest themselves as substance abuse when we get into middle and high school and that is reality and it is reality that we have a substance abuse problem amongst our teens in our district it is just the way it is we have got to find a way to partner to recruit to train find the resources to bring more counselors and I don't mean academic counselors I mean mental health counselors and behavior specialists to our district um, the days of kids walking into a school just to learn are over it doesn't happen anymore um, I remember when I was in school in the 70s you went to learn all your teacher did was educate you if you were not well behaved you were just kicked out you, you were just gone and um, it, that doesn't happen anymore and so if we for all children it doesn't happen and I think it's this if it's not the school's responsibility who is who will be responsible who is going to step up to the plate to help the kids our mental health problem in Jefferson City is way bigger than our school district um, every needs assessment I have ever seen mental health services the lack of them rises to the top in every aspect of our community this is a bigger picture than our district our district is is right in there with every organization every every aspect of our community we we need mental health services period okay Steve well I'd rather have too many than not enough when it comes to mental health health in a school uh, I don't know if we'll get volunteers from the mental health community to fill in like as simple as the big brothers and sisters do be nice if they would we can communicate with them and see if that would happen that's a good idea it's all about the money uh, mental health is a problem throughout the United States go to the VA hospital uh, it, it's a problem it just is the uh, school system uh, I would have to disagree to a point uh, it, it, we're responsible for your child when he gets on the bus we're responsible for your child when he's at school therefore it's mental health there there's resources available for that child we're responsible for your child getting on that bus until he gets off the bus at home that's when our responsibility ends I mean Jesus Christ himself said there will always be the poor and suffering we can only do the best we can with the resources that the Jefferson City School District has money wise but when they're at school we need to put forth the best effort we can and there's plenty of other programs out there that need to step up whether it is parents as teachers whether it is school pro, uh, uh, church programs boys and girls club YMCA it's got to be a combined community effort the community has to do it If the community doesn't have the will to step up this Jeff City School District is not going to be able to do it okay Jessica my senior year of high school I was in a program called a plus and so I spent part of my semester one of my semesters I got to go into or terms I guess is what they called it then I got to go into a third grade classroom and I got to basically be a teacher's assistant, assistant and it was really fun so one of the little girls started having a complete meltdown one day and just simple she didn't need a mental health professional with credentials on their name she literally just needed someone to talk to 
and that's exactly what I was there for. Sometimes we go, I'm not saying we don't need mental health professionals because we do, because there are serious mental health issues, but sometimes we go straight for the extreme, forgetting that before that, we could take small steps, such as there's university across the street, down the street and across the street from the Board of Education office with a really good education program. There's no rhyme or reason why those students have not been brought into our classrooms, into our schools, to just simply be there. So if you've got one or two kids having a meltdown, the teacher can continue to teach. There is someone there that may not necessarily have their degree yet, but they can pull a child aside and just simply say, what do you need? What can I do to help you? I mean, I was a senior in high school when I was able to help a child having a meltdown. So it's, it's, sometimes it's really kind of, it's not as hard as what we're trying to make it. Until we can get the mental health professionals in the classrooms, there are things that can be done to fill in until that day comes. And like I said, sometimes it's literally just a matter of I just need someone to talk to. I'm having a hard time right now in class. Maybe I don't do good with a really good crowd. So for this person that's in my classroom to be able to take me out of my classroom and just spend some time with me for a moment by myself, then when I go back into that classroom, my day goes smooth. Because at that moment, I just simply needed one person to just listen to what I was feeling at that moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, we'll start with Stephanie. Does the school district have a diversity problem? And if so, define the problem and explain how we should fix it. We absolutely have a diversity problem in our school district. Um, and I don't think that it's necessarily um, from lack of trying. I think that the issue is, is that we're not thinking outside of the box. Um, it's not enough to wait for diversity to come to you. I mean, we've we've got to go out and we've got to figure out a way to do it. We have an HBCU in this community. Um, now, a couple of things that I've learned from Dr. Seymour, the Dean of Education over at Lincoln, is that it is very common for their education majors to get their degree and go back home to teach. People like to go back home to teach. Um, so then, his recommendation that I thought was great was, and that he's shared with the public schools, Jeff City Public Schools, is the Grow Your Own program, um, where you are cultivating and inspiring current students to enter the education field, um, where they um, are cultivated in a way to go off to college, wherever that may be, get their degree in education, and come home to teach here. And so I think that's a really good idea. Uh, and I think we should pursue that. I also think that um, we need to work closely with the education majors at Lincoln, ensure that they are student teaching in schools that, that, they, that they want, that they enjoy, that they feel connected to. Um, at the Boys and Girls Club, when you come to our classrooms, you, we have African Americans in, in leading every room uh, at the club. And so we met with Dr. Seymour and Dr. Linthicum and said, okay, if, if we have this and we've got these Lincoln students that are falling in love with Jeff City kids, let's pipeline. Let's, let's try to segue into getting some careers. I think that's what it's going to take is some out-of-the-box thinking. Okay. Steve? I'm not even sure what the recruiting, how you go about recruiting teachers. I'm, I'm just not... Like again, I'm just not familiar with the method. I'm, I'm on a learning curve here, but I, I do know the obvious. And the obvious is this. Uh, let's say you're gonna grow your own. Well, that's a, how many years out is that? If, if we want to have the best teachers and to develop diversity, that may be, needs to be done uh, by actively recruiting, uh, going out and getting teachers, whether it's in the Wall Street Journal or what? I don't know. I, I'm not, I don't know how they do that. Uh, I will say this, I don't care what the color the teacher is. I don't care about sexuality or gender. I do care about their credentials and, and their work ethics and, and that, how good are the teachers? Uh, should it turn out if we could get lucky and, and, and get uh, minorities in, 
the classroom, more the better. It's fact of life that we live in a diverse society. We, uh, there's a certain percentage are going to be minorities, a certain percentage are going to be uh, the majority. So, I mean, that's a fact of life. A kid walking in a classroom sees X amount of white students and X amount of uh, minority students. Uh, that's called life. Whether the teacher is black or white means nothing to me. What it means to me is I want the best teacher. And if we can get diversity and minority teachers, more the better. But the bottom line is, is quality. I, I, I'm, I'm not PC on this at all. And Jessica. I find the diversity topic to be a very hard one to talk about. Probably shouldn't be for me, but it is. I tell my team of campaign people that all the time. So <clears throat> I grew up in this city, born and raised, and as an African-American student going through the school district, it was very hard to not find teachers who looked like me. Um, it was very hard to feel like I was understood. My counselors didn't look like me. My principals didn't look like me. Um, and finding a teacher, a staff member who looked like me, was hard to do. So I will say that diverse, you want the best, yes. However, the reality is if you take a white child and you put them in the inner city in an all black school or a majority black school, they're probably going to find themselves uncomfortable because you just, you, you're, what, what, what makes you comfortable is what you're familiar with. And so if I can see people like me and I, it lets me know that they're more than likely gonna understand the issues that I'm having and the struggles that I'm having. When it comes to recruiting, I don't know how recruiting is done, but I can say that you, I've said this before, I will be finishing up my elementary education degree here in a few, few years. So if I walked into our Board of Education building, I would not want to continue to pursue a career in this district. And that's only because the Board of, Edu Board, the Board of Education building will tell me what the school system looks like and the Board of Education building itself is not diverse when it comes to race or culture. So I wouldn't want to, I would prefer to go somewhere and teach where I know that people are gonna be there who look like me, because it is hard to work with people who don't look like you, to work or to go to school in a place where there's not a lot of staff that look like you do, because you, you need to feel comfortable and you've gotta feel understood. You want the best people for the job, but you also want all of our students to feel like there is someone in this building that can relate to me. Okay, Lorelai. Yeah, you know, we've had um, we've had difficulty recruiting uh, minorities, and our, our our teachers and our and our administration they don't reflect the population of our students. And um, we've been working at that. I, I don't know that it's intentional that it's that way and I don't know that we're doing the right things I think we might be able to do better I don't know again I'm not an HR person either I don't know about recruiting however I was extremely excited about the grow your own program um, I met a professor at um, and she talked to me about Dr. Seymour and I immediately called Shelby Scarborough and said we need to get with Dr. Seymour and we need to get on this grow your own program we need to identify students in our school district who uh, are willing to go through a teaching even at Lincoln and keep them here because it's hard to recruit to Jefferson City, Missouri. I mean, not, there's not a lot of people who want to come from New York City to Jefferson City, Missouri. I mean, you know, and you can't get some of these uh, inner city good teachers to come to Jefferson City. So we have to figure out a way to solve the problem. And I love the Grow Your Own program. And it's no, it's not going to overnight fix our problem, but I think that we can really start moving the needle with that program. And I'm excited about it. Okay, next question. Steve, what do you think the district's facility construction and renovation priority should be after the completion of the two high school projects? Repeat that question, please. What do you think the district's facility construction and renovation priority should be after the completion of the two high school projects? Uh, I would think the construction would be done. Is I, I don't know that anything else needs to be built. I, I, if that's the question, I, the priorities uh, they've already re reinvented the old high school, and they've invented a new one. Uh, my taxes have gone up, 
So I don't think I want to reinvent anything more. Uh, for right now, I don't think there is anything else left to build. Uh, unless, unless there's something I'm not aware of. Okay. Jessica? Let's see our elementary school playgrounds. Um, I know that my kids at their elementary school have gone and just kind of walked around on their playground while they play because I check in, on them, check in on them every now and then. And it could definitely use some updates. Um, I mean, just kind of some new equipment, maybe some better stuff because it's limited to what's out there already. Um, and then the stuff that's out there isn't necessarily in the best shape or the best condi condition. So I'd say definitely take a look at our elementary school playgrounds and then maybe our middle school tracks. Okay. Lorelai? Uh, okay, so I co-chaired <coughs> the Long Range Facilities Planning Committee, and I <coughs> I'm passionate about this one because um, I think what we've done in this community is wait until there's a crisis and then beg the people for money so that we can build a facility. And I believe that we need to be on a more systematic schedule. And we developed a plan, a 20-year plan, of what facilities we were going to need and when, knowing that we were going to have to relook at it. And then when we built the, the – we asked on the bond issue for the second high school, we said the next focus is going to be on the east side. But the reality is – Every single one of our schools is going to have overcrowding issues. Our middle schools are busting. We got problems at both middle schools. We've got problems at many of our elementary schools, which is exactly why we created a boundary um, policy to say that we are not going to look at boundaries every 20 years because it's a hard conversation to have. We're going to look at boundaries every three to four to five years and if we need to shift populations to keep the number of students in an elementary school we're going to do it and I know it's emotional and I know it makes people unhappy but it's either that or raise <coughs> taxpayer dollars and build more elementary schools but we are going to have to solve some problems at our middle schools probably next or another elementary school on the east side of town and then shift a bunch of population through all the elementary schools but I am a I am think that we need to go back to that twenty year plan that we developed and see what was next on the list. Okay, Stephanie. I sat on the same committee um, <laughs> under Lorelai, and uh, I, I absolutely agree. A lot of people, a lot of stakeholders in our community spent a tremendous amount of time. We studied the conditions of the buildings. We studied uh, the current overcrowding we looked at what was projected growth of overcrowding um, at the time East school it was shocking at what a low score that building had I know that the district thankfully has invested a considerable amount of money to renovate but um, I'm with Lorelei uh, a plan was put into place about a new school on the east side about uh, a, a, a potential additional middle school um, there's a plan in place and and we need to follow it revisit it of course but we need to follow it but I will say what Steve said we have to breathe for a minute we can't just go right next year and say okay we need more money but I recall I was involved in the bond committee as well we will be able to do a few renovations when we pay down that bond where we don't have to go back to the community for more tax dollars. So uh, I agree. We have a plan. We need to follow it. Okay. Jessica, during the campaign to pass that bond issue and operating levy increase for the two high school plan, the board committed to next addressing space and facility issues at East Elementary School. If you're elected, would you be committed to fulfilling that promise? East yes yes that's actually where my oldest daughter started so when the boundary lines happened it was a little bit frustrating because she had gotten so used to staff there um, I actually went to East and graduated my fifth grade year from there so um, I definitely say that that school I feel like has been neglected for a very long time not just as far as renovations and the space that they have but I mean I think they've been neglected academically as well but um, I definitely would I can't say that I can promise that you know East school would have some things done because there's other people that have to be convinced to make that decision but I can definitely say that I would definitely be pushing for East school to get the things that they need to help with their space whether it be staffing more classrooms additions to the building not just trailers in a parking lot 
um, I definitely would be pushing for them to get some things. Lorelai. Well, I was part of the, the, the people who made that commitment. Mm -hmm. And I think what our commitment was that we would do something on the east side of town. We have, we, since then, we have moved <coughs> some population out of east over to Morrow Heights, and we have, east has gotten some significant renovations. And so I think that's helped alleviate um, the, um, the overcrowding at east. And I think things are a little bit better there. But I, d I am committed to our next, we have to do something uh, either on the east end of town or with both middle schools. We've got to do something to alleviate uh, the population at our middle schools and on the east end of town. Okay, Stephanie? Um, I am so grateful that some money was put into East School. Um, it's hard for me where I work not to be extremely passionate about the learning environment at East School. So I'm glad that they reduced the population, put some real renovation in the building. Our, our long-range strategic planning committee recommended, as Lorelei said, a new facility of some sort on the east side of town. Now, whether that is a new east school, a second elementary school, potentially uh, kind of like how we did LC and TJ on both sides of town, of town that there is a, a school built on both sides that um, kind of like a five, six maybe type building, a, a junior high. Or, um, I think that we definitely need to hold true to that commitment that that committee it was the second recommendation um, and the question I remember the debate was the high school or East school um, and and we all felt that the high school situation was far was more critical it impacted more children um, but I would definitely be committed to something uh, new on the east side Steve you know on the playground there the asphalt playground, they got these squares by yay big, different colors where the kids line up on. You know, it's what the teachers control the mm -hmm. kids, you know. I painted about four dozen of those on my hands and knees, and I was not passionate about doing that. Not at all. <laughs> it hurt. My wife, my church adopts that school. It's their school. So we're, I'm familiar with the school and the playground. And uh, it, that does, yeah, that, that east side of town has, uh, by purpose or accidental or whatever, is kind of neglected. It's just an old part of town. It's just an older part of town. Most of the people there are middle income. You know, they don't have a lot of money to throw around. And it, it does need some, some help, and it has for a long time. It's, it was in the paper quite a bit concerning the high schools. You know, the east side of town is getting a, a raw deal because of it. But I don't think that. I think that the right decision to build a school up where it was at was the right decision, of course. But, yeah, I think the, the east school could use a little TLC. Absolutely. Get somebody to paint those squares. <laughs> okay, so we'll start with our closing statements at this time. So we'll start with Laura Lee. Oh, all right. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak tonight. I am interested in running for a second term because I feel like we have great momentum. I think we have plenty of, of problems to tackle, and I uh, am not afraid to have those hard conversations and tackle those problems. But I think that over the last three years since I've been on the board, we've made tremendous strides. We got a bond issue passed. We've got a second high school that's been talked about in this community for 30 years. We, our APR has come up from 70 to 87. Uh, and we've got, we've, we're really putting some things in place to move the needle. And I'm excited about it. I'm really excited about where we can go with our public schools. And I'm not afraid to tackle some things that need to be tackled. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Stephanie. My entire career right now is dedicated to serving the children in our community that come from some of the toughest backgrounds. And um, working with them, I see the struggles that they go through. I see um, improvements that could be made to, to benefit them and their academic performance. I think our school board is, is a great group of people that are, are truly committed and passionate uh, about serving our district. And 
I think what I could bring as a school board member is to is to basically round that out and to be a voice for the children uh, in our community that that need us the most thank you Steve I moved to Callaway County to get out of town basically just because I wanted to live in the country one of the uh, things we looked for was a house that was in the Jeff City School District. I was not going to leave the Jeff City School District. Jeff City School District gave a lot to my family. They educated my son. And I'm retired and I play bad golf and I got to thinking that there's something I could do to help to pay back the community. And uh, this just attracted my attention because like it or not, the kids are the future. Whether you love them or hate them, they're still the future. And they need to be educated. That's my goal. Thank you. Jessica? I'm also thankful for the opportunity to run for this board. My interest was piqued when um, being emerged in this community and from this community and dealing with a lot of kids in this community, friends, kids, and things like that, kids at our church. Um, I have found, I realized that academically, there is a huge focus on the academics, which is great. I think that's amazing. But my interest was peaked because socially and emotionally and mentally, I get the chance to deal with students after their elementary schools, their middle schools, their high schools are done with them with working at Lincoln. And that's definitely an area that needs some serious improvement. That's d district wise across the board. Every state needs improvement in that, um, but definitely our district. So. I love the academic side of things and I definitely want to be a voice that brings some importance on parental involvement and the social, emotional, and mental well-being of our students. Thank you. On behalf of the News Tribune, I would like to thank all of you for being here, participating in the forum, and, and graciously answering those questions. I'd also like to thank the city again and JCTV staff for their assistance in putting this forum on. In addition to stories about these forums in tomorrow's News Tribune, I need to get my plug in there right now, pick up your copy <laughs> tomorrow, we will have a variety of other means by which you can become more informed about these races. We'll be asking uh, the candidates questions that I did not get to tonight, and our hope is that we will be able to publish some of those in Sunday's paper and, and future issues of the News Tribune. Lastly, we will publish a voter's guide on Sunday, March 31st. The school district in democracy is served best by an informed and active electorate. I said this last night at the city forums, I have repeated here, uh, we are best served when voters are educated about who they're voting for, why they're voting, and then getting to the polls. And that's my encouragement to us as voters is that we would do the research and go to the polls April 2nd. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.